Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. This is the first section in chapter 13 of that hideous strength. Stand. Stand where you are and tell me your name and business, said Ransom. The ragged figure on the threshold tilted its head a little sideways like one who cannot quite hear. At the same moment, the wind from the open door had its way with the house. The inner door between the scullery and the kitchen clapped to with a loud bang, isolating the three men from the women, and a large tin basin fell clattering into the sink. The stranger took a pace further into the room. Star, said Ransom in a loud voice. In nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti, dic me hiqui sis, et quam ob causam venoris. The stranger raised his hand and flung back the dripping hair from his forehead. The light fell full on his face, from which Ransom had the impression of an immense quietness. Every muscle of this man's body seemed as relaxed as if he were asleep, and he stood absolutely still. Each drop of rain from the khaki coat struck the tiled floor exactly where the drop before it had fallen. His eyes rested on Ransom for a second or two with no particular interest. Then he turned his head to his left to where the door was flung back against the wall. McPhee was concealed behind it. Come out, said the stranger in Latin. The words were spoken softly, but so deep that even in that wind-shaken room they made a kind of vibration. But what surprised Ransom much more was the fact that McPhee immediately obeyed. He didn't look at Ransom, but at the stranger. Then, unexpectedly, he gave an enormous yawn. The stranger looked him up and down, and then turned to the director. Fellow, he said in Latin, tell the lord of this house that I am come. As he spoke, the wind from behind him was whipping the coat about his legs, and blowing his hair over his forehead, but his great mass stood as if it had been planted like a tree, and he seemed in no hurry. And the voice, too, was such as one might imagine to be the voice of a tree, large and slow and patient, drawn up through roots and clay and gravel from the depths of the earth. I am the master here, said Ransom in the same language. To be sure, answered the stranger, and yonder whippersnapper is without doubt your bishop. He didn't exactly smile, but a look of disquieting amusement came into his keen eyes. Suddenly he poked his head forward, so as to bring his face much nearer to the director's. Tell your master that I am come, he repeated. Welcome to our third installment of the Lost Lewis Tapes, focusing on the Ransom Trilogy by C.S. Lewis. Once again, I am joined by an expert in the Ransom Trilogy, David Downing, and by our producer, Aaron Hill. And we are really excited about discussing this last novel. So let's just get into it. David, what do you think of this novel? Well, this is probably the most... Uh best liked or least liked of the Ransom Trilogy. It's by far longer than the other two. In fact, it's longer than the other two combined, Out of Silent Planet and Paralandra. Some people love the fullness of it and all the different motifs that are interwoven. Other people feel it's a little overfill. Uh, as a matter of fact, he wrote an abridged edition called The Tortured Planet, where he tried to cut it down. But uh, so it's, What did he cut out when he oh, cut yeah. it down? I didn't, didn't even he, know about that. Oh, is either. that right? Well, that's why we have a podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> He didn't cut out major scenes. He just cut out phrasing. Uh, it, oh. You can actually go through, and a lot of long sentences become short sentences. Yeah. Well, and he and, repeats things. Yes, and he tried not to do that in The Tortured Planet. Ironically, though, it soon went out of print, and that hideous strength, of course, is still selling well. So people mm. wanted the full dose of C.S. Lewis. Huh. It's different from the other two. First, we went off to Mars, and then we went to Venus. And people who like fantasy, they want exotic landscapes, and they want to meet yeah. strange creatures. And that sense of atmosphere, otherworldly atmosphere. So some people are disappointed by the third one because it takes place on Earth. It's a spiritual battle uh, here on Earth. Other people think it's a very fitting culmination. We've met uh, Feverstone, or excuse me, we've met Dick Devine and Weston in the first novel, Out of Silent Planet. Then Weston reappears in Paralandra as a kind of serpent in the unfallen Eden of that world. Yeah. And when we get back to that hideous strength, the battle comes to our home turf here, and Dick Devine reappears as Lord Feverstone. Yeah. 
So structurally, it fits in very well with the other two. Some people think that Charles Williams had a bad influence on Lewis. Uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, they had become good friends, uh, and he was a very stimulating uh, partner in the Inklings. But his novels tend to be very loosely structured. Yeah. And he will juggle about five or six motifs in one novel. And people, some people called uh, that hideous strength a Charles Williams novel by C.S. Lewis. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, where the, the vision comes. Well, it's, and he goes, it goes from Mars to Venus to committee meetings at a university. <laughs> right, right. I mean, talk about a, <laughs> talk about a change, yes, you know? Yeah. But David and I, both having been on faculty uh, yes. and attending committee meetings, mm. Lewis has captured something there. It's almost like he wants to say, you know, there are insidious forces <laughs> on our <laughs> own planet. And there's that famous statement by Henry Kissinger, it's attributed to him, where he says, the reason that university politics is so vicious is because the stakes are so small. Yeah. But he, so it's like Lewis is changing that idea up. Mm. What if the stakes were really large? Yeah, what if it and, really depended on the outcome of a committee meeting? Right, right, right. But he's very insightful about academic life. He says things like, often the most powerful man in the room, in those days definitely a man, be this quiet person who sits in the back, but you find out they're actually orchestrating things. Yeah. Where the people who get up and give long, pompous speeches actually have very little power and people just endure their contributions. So it's a great academic satire, especially if you are an academic. Yeah. It's unusual in that nothing supernatural happens for half the novel. Yeah. And out of the silent planet, uh, we're on Mars pretty quickly, yeah. or at least we're in space. And Paralander, he goes almost immediately to Venus after the opening scene. But literally, halfway through the novel, nothing has happened yet. Of yeah. a, of a Although you have character. Jane's dreams, yeah. which are pretty creepy. I think, I think I was actually telling Crystal before we started the podcast that I think this would actually be the way to start if you were ever going to adapt the Ransom trilogy to film, would be to start with that hideous strength and kind of tease the character of Ransom. But the I think you could actually make a lot of Jane's visions and then them being fulfilled. Uh, listening back to it again and rereading it, the vision she has of um, Bill the Blizzard getting killed. Right. And she says that she sees these rods of light. And that's so intrigued me. I go, oh, is, are those Eldos? Are those bad Eldos or good Eldos? What right. is she seeing in her vision? And so I was actually very intrigued by her visions this last time I read it. So, mm. Well, she mm. thinks she's neurotic and she doesn't realize that she's dreaming realities. Um, Lewis himself was a little worried about it. He said in a letter when it was half written, I think I may have written 250 pages of sheer bosh. Oh. Um, <laughs> and so he realized it didn't have the same fantasy quality of the first two. He does explain in the intro that in a real fairy tale, he calls this a fairy tale for grownups. In a real fairy tale, you start out in a woodman's college, cottage. And to us, we know we're in a fairy tale because it doesn't sound at all like yeah. modern world. Yeah. When the, those fairy tales were told, the real world started with living in a cottage in the woods. Uh, so he's uh, adapting that idea. Let's start in the real world and slowly introduce the supernatural or the, the marvelous. Yeah. I, th I feel like, though, he could have mixed in some of the things that are flashbacks earlier in the book. This is, I shouldn't, this, I'm thinking about how do you adapt this for film, but like some of the stuff with Merlin, you could have put some of that stuff in the front first part of the book with mm -hmm. some of the druids and I don't know, it would have, you know, spiced it up and got you a little bit more exciting, you know, because the descent of the gods, you get to the, towards the end of the book and it gets really, really big, you know? Right. Everything, uh, the most exciting part is the second half of the story. Yeah. Uh, I think he, um, Paired it with the abolition of man. He tells you to read abolition of man in the intro to that hideous strength. In every book, he sort of had a target. And definitely in the first one, he wanted to critique evolutionism or Wellsianity. He called it from H.G. Wells. Mm -hmm. In the second novel, uh, Weston is really spouting a lot of uh, the life force, the Elan Vital of, of yeah. Bergson. And I think in this one, he's really going after the ideas that he critiques in abolition of man. Yeah, that modern academia is becoming totally utilitarian and rational. I was I was fascinated, David, by uh, reading back through it of the scene where they go to visit uh, Cure Hardy. Is that the name of it? Right, Cure yeah. Hardy. Mm -hmm. He goes. They go to visit Cure Hardy, and uh, the sort of joke about well, we can sort of write most of the report before we even go out there because we kind of right. know what we're looking for, the undesirables and whatnots. Uh, and then they go there, and uh, Mark is sort of caught up in the moment, the old 
people and the old lady that reminds him of his aunt and all these kinds of things. And so you can see Lewis trying to insert that humanity and sort of nostalgia you know, into it and contrasting it with that sort of pure rationalism throughout the mm. story. So. Which is one of his themes in all three of the Ransom Trilogy novels is the dangers of abstraction. You cease to empathize and see real people. He wrote a letter to a little girl and say, don't say mortality rose, say more people died. And uh, mm. Mark is a sociologist and he says he doesn't think of men and women. He thinks of the agrarian classes satirizing the tendency of academics to see things in very abstract terms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But especially sociology in his time, because the father of sociology was Auguste Comte. Right, Comte. Mm-hmm. And um, he is also the generator of what is known as positivism. Right. Right. He mm-hmm. believed in social evolution and how he constructed, and he's an 18th century, well, he lived, um, he died 1857, but he suggested that um, the first stage humans go through is the theological stage, which is pure fiction, you know, and for him, he's just one of those Enlightenment, French Enlightenment thinkers who Uh totally dismisses religion. And then the second stage is a metaphysical stage that goes back, okay, that's an advance beyond, you know, dumb Christian theology. Yeah. It goes back to more the way the Greek ancient Greeks like Aristotle and Plato thought. And then the third stage is positivism. Mm -hmm. And hence the sociologist is someone who just uses positivistic scientific measures Mm. to understand humanity. Observation. So the fact that he turns Mark into a sociologist is extremely significant if you look back to the origins of sociology. That's true. And sociology is still evil today, wouldn't you say? <laughs> oh, maybe that's an overreach. I'm sorry. Maybe. I'm sorry. I have a question, David. What a, What's the deal with pragmatometry? Obviously, it's something that Lewis invents, but what is pragmatometry? What is he trying to satirize there? Well, uh, Busby and Curry are very low-level uh, faculty members at Bracton College, and their idea is to put science on a scientific basis. And they don't realize what's really going on at NICE. Yeah. Uh, so the idea of the pragmatometer is that we're going to come up with a specific measure of how in- efficient we're being. <laughs> and he's definitely making fun of people who want to bring efficiency to academia and to yeah. government. But they don't realize that uh, I argue in my book, Planets in Peril, that as Mark is getting more and more in with the people at NICE, uh-huh. he's actually undergoing the circles of the inferno. Really? And yeah, in Paralandra, he experiences the purgatorio uh, as he climbs in the mountain at the end. And then mm. he comes out at the top of the holy mountain, yeah. which is a phrase straight out of uh, Dante, uh-huh. and experiences this great dance, yeah. which is really very much like uh, the Paradiso. Yeah. It's oh, like definitely, the yeah. great rose. But since he's already used Dante so much for the purgatorio and the Paradiso, why not use the Inferno? Huh. And I actually have a... Uh, chapter where I talk about going to the wheels within the wheels. He starts out with the people oh. that look important, but they think all they're trying to do is make the study of science very efficient. Uh-huh. And then the second level is people like Fe- Feverstone and Hardcastle who think what they're really doing is making the human race uh, more fit. They're going to yeah. liquidate the unfit. Uh, that's, once Hence, again, we're we back to about, eugenics. Yeah, back yeah. to eugenics. Yeah. And then at the final stage, we discover this whole thing is really a demonic conspiracy. But as you go huh. through, he actually meets people who are in the vestibule. They're very, like Curry is the only one who survives the disaster at the yeah. end. Because he wasn't evil. He was just sort of pretentious and pompous. <laughs> yes. uh, but then he meets the heretics like Parsons Drake. Oh, yeah. And then he meets the angry and the sullen. And eventually he gets down huh. to those who betray country and kindred. Yeah. And some of the language in that hideous strength is liter- literal translations from the Inferno. Oh, really? Yeah. The, the, I mean, with names like Wither and Frost, they're yeah. really in on the conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, whereas at St. Anne's, we're going to have to talk about their parallel journeys between Jane and Mark. Yeah. Mm. Um, but they literally know what's going on. But at one point, Frost is almost in the state of uh, demonic a psychic residue, very similar to Weston. Yeah. And Unman. Yeah. And Lewis says, so full of sleep are those who lose the intellectual good. 
which is a word for word translation from the Inferno. So he's having a lot of fun with thinking this is kind of a new Inferno. And he also, I mentioned already that the protagonist is no longer Ransom. His novels are really about spiritual pilgrimages. Mm-hmm. And Ransom started out very fearful, very apprehensive, felt like yeah, he was yeah. in way over his head. The first time he's abducted, the second time he volunteers to go, but he still feels very inadequate and he's angry at God for giving him this mission that he can't accomplish in Paralander. Now he's kind of achieved this sanctified status. Yeah. That he's in the upper room. It reminds me of the grandma Irene in uh, The Princess and the yeah. Goblin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to go visit him. But he's a very numinous figure. When Jane first meets him, she's just blown away. Thinks by this he looks like he's 20 years old right. or something. Yeah. But he's really old. So it, the protagonists become the, the aesthetics, Mark and Jane. They're in an unhappy marriage. And Jane is kind of taking the way of affirmation. She goes to St. Anne's where Ransom and his community uh-huh. are. In every chapter, you see this spiritual healing yeah. more and more. It turns out her dream is not just neuroses. Her dream is really visions. And that's actually why Nice wants her husband, Mark, is they want to get a hold of Jane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas Mark, it's worse and worse. First, he just hangs around with just kind of these pompous fellows like Busby and Curry. He wants to be important. He wants to right. be important. The he wants to be in the inner ring. Inner right. ring. Yeah. Yeah, that Lewis wrote a whole essay about this. Yeah. Right. Desire. And so you just subtly say what, you think people want you to say so that you'll be accepted, you'll be regarded as intellectual. Yeah. And I'm sure Lewis saw that in academia. Uh-huh. I've seen it in academia. Oh, well, he, yeah. He has this line where uh, Mark is getting interviewed by Wither, you know, and Wither, every time he asks him a direct question, Wither just, oh, yeah. Like pontificates yeah. on yeah. nothingness, you know, and <laughs> as you're reading it, you can just hear him saying this in your head. And you've heard, I've heard so many people talk like this in academia, and you're like, what are you saying? But he has this little aside, and it's like, God help him. Mark was young. And then he oh. says, yeah. he repeats something, and it's like he has this like empathy for him as a character. Like, you know, he's young and he just wants to fit in. And so he says something stupid, and it's just, yeah. Crazy. And he says yeah. something like, he had a, a good deal of the cocker spaniel in him. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I love the scenes uh, with Wither where he says, now, don't be too audacious and get too out in front because that would be a fatal mistake. <laughs> but also, you've got to show some initiative. If you're just a follower, that's a fatal mistake. Yeah. And I've been in many a tenure review where the young faculty member felt like you've got to be a great teacher, so don't get obsessed with their scholarship. But you got to do scholarship, so make sure that your scholarship <laughs> is excellent. And the poor young faculty member is kind of going, well, what are you telling me here? You know, how am I supposed to? Yeah. Yeah. So once again, if you're an academic, I think you enjoy this novel more than people in other Probably. professions. Probably, yeah. Yeah. At the same time, it seems to me that Lewis is setting up the problem with polarized thinking. Mm. He has all these binaries throughout Mm -hmm. the novel. So you have head versus heart. And of course, he literalizes a head that has been totally severed from any sense of the heart. You have two powerful women who have names that echo each other. So Mm. you have Ironwood and Hardcastle. Hardcastle. Iron is a more positive image than just pure hardness. Mm -hmm. And the wood in her name implies tie to nature versus Hardcastle is, okay, human constructions, you know, and this is what Lewis is analyzing is how we set up human constructions and determine them to be absolute objective reality. And it strikes me, since he brought up uh, the abolition of man in his preface to this novel, it seems to me a lot of Christians misread that book by assuming that Lewis is arguing for absolute objectivity, Mm. whereas he's criticizing the idea of absolute objectivity in uh, hideous strength, that that is the paradigm of modernists who have been shaped by the Enlightenment, shaped by the sociological positivism of of Comte, um, shaped by the demythologizing of the Germans. Yeah. So he's doing something so much more subtle. Yeah. Uh, I agree about the names. Ironwood is a real kind of tree, an ironwood tree. 
Oh, really? Uh, there's also oh, I Ivy Mags, uh, Ivy, and oh, there's yeah. Camilla. Yeah. The people at St. Anne's are into nature and faith, and yeah. their names reflect it. Whereas I said already at, at NICE, which is an ironic name for the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments. I know. Uh, the old word for NICE, actually, etymologically, it comes from no knowledge, necessary. Really? Yeah. So the word has a very long history. Huh. And so it's ironic that they're called NICE and they're considered to be a very scientific institute. Yeah. But etymologically, the word NICE means no knowledge. You you don't know what you think you know. Crystal, I think on that issue of you are saying about like objectivity, I think Lewis does a really good job of critiquing all these different aspects of modern society that we don't yes. question. When I was reading through it again this last time, I sort of developed an appreciation for the insights that he has that are just, they just kind of come and go. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to mention one, Mark is having this conversation with Hardcastle. He's just gotten a nice and he f doesn't feel like he fits in and he's had to pay a bunch of money to get into this club that he's not really sure how it works. And so he's having this conversation with her and she's telling him all these things about police work. And it felt very relevant to the discussion we're having in the U.S. today about policing oh, and things like mm -hmm. that. And he says the shift you want to make is to go from uh, retribution or vindictive. So we, you get punished for what you've done. And once you've satisfied that punishment, we release you. You want to focus on rehabilitation because then right. it's up to us to decide once you've been rehabilitated and we can kind of keep that carrot going. But then he throws in this little sort of line just out of nowhere about preventing crime. And hints that mm. that's the real trick, because then if you think about it, if you if the focus is on crime prevention, well, if you if there is no crime or the crime is bad, then you're clearly doing the right thing. So keep up what you're doing. But if you then you have crime, then you need to do more crime prevention. And so that it just sort of spirals out of control and you lose sight of actually having any sort of justice. And you're basically punishing people before they actually do anything wrong. And I thought. Wow. I mean, it's just incredibly relevant to our society today um, mm. in terms of the ways that policing can go out of control. But it's just this little conversation he has with Hardcastle. And I feel like there's a lot of those throughout the novel. That... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has a lot of rich passages. Some people think it's over full. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, satire of fascism mm -hmm. because especially uh, the uh, fascists in Italy, they would start the riot and then they would bring in the, the black church to break up the riot. Uh-huh. And uh, mm. so their their real thing is power. They're using social unrest as a means of consolidating their power. And that's the first time that Mark really starts to, uh, in fact, they say, well, actually, this is the first, of, this is the second of several wars. And he says, you people not only are fomenting uh, riots, but you're fomenting world wars. And so very slowly, as I say, he takes the negative path. Jane uh, gets more and more spiritual insight and healing by hanging around uh -huh. St. Anne's with yeah. Ransom and the company. Whereas Mark takes the via negativa. He sees worse and worse people yeah. and more and more criminal behavior. And it's not until they want him to uh, want to use him to basically abduct his wife because of her second sight that he realizes yeah. these people are evil. You know, I need to do something. Crystal, so you're talking about the objectivity. A lot of it is rationality. Uh, in Abolition of Man, he says the old view of the human being was you have the head, which is rationality and utility, and you have the chest, which is sentiment, moral values, and then you have the gut, which is appetites. And what happens at NICE is you have these hyper-rationalists who want to use yeah, total they utility. they sever the head, yes, right. from the body. This one guy wants to get rid of all organic life because he thinks it's messy and he wants everything to be totally mechanical or artificial. Yeah. And uh, Feverstone really represents the appetites. He doesn't really care one way or the other. This is the old yeah. Dick Divine from Out of the yeah. Silent Planet. Yeah. So these are literally a men without chest or people without chest. They have no moral values. It's either straight utility or else it's personal self-interest. Yeah. But by giving up their bodies and the sort of, you know, physical side of things, they lose part of what makes them human beings, right. you know, total right. human beings. And so they, they become very cold and calculating and they can do all kinds of evil things without it, you know, affecting them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very fascinating the way he depicts that in the novel. He, I think he describes that in Abolition of Man as the magician's bargain. Right, You know, right. you give up something and you get power in return, and in the end you just end up being dominated by these dark spiritual forces because mm -hmm. you give up your humanity. Right. Well, and the fact right. this was written during the war, as you're implying, so you get um, the fascism of both 
Italy and Germany, yeah. and how interesting that Philostrato is described as an Italian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did Lewis talk much about Hitler and Nazism? Because that's the perfect example of a head that is detached from the heart, that yeah. Hitler could just convince thousands of people, including Christians, yeah. that this ideology is what they have to buy into, that you're not supposed to be sympathetic to yeah. Jews, to people with crippling diseases, yeah. that you just sever any compassion for the marginalized. You can and justify any sort of cruelty as long as it makes Germany strong. He does have illusions throughout. At one point they say it's almost as if we lost the war which would mean the Germans are running the country. Yeah, when they're going through and destroying uh, right. and kicking people out of their houses right. and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, another, he has this symbol of the muscular naked man with a thunderbolt, Lightning which bolt. is a very yeah. uh, Nazi oh, symbol. Right. Yeah. Right. And one place he mentions both, uh, he mentions uh, the secret police, one of which was Agpu, which is the Russian secret police. So he's bringing Stalin mm. in here too. Oh. Yeah. This is really trying to bring totalitarianism to England, uh, which he saw happening already. And so in some ways, this is dystopian novel. If things keep going the way they're going, we're going to have a totalitarian system here in huh. England. Mm. He actually read in one of his letters, he read an experiment. He claims that German scientists were trying to keep a dog's head alive artificially, pumping blood uh. into its brain and well, getting they oxygen did. to it. They did? They, they did. did. That's a real thing, yeah. And then I think at one point they sewed two dogs together or something. Really? Yeah. Wow. So now we've offended sociologists and Germans I in know. this podcast? I know, I know. Yeah. You know who fascinates me in this novel is McPhee. Oh, okay. Uh, he kind so, of annoys me a little bit. Well, he's uh, supposed to be. I, I, yeah, he's supposed to be annoying, but that's what's so fascinating about it. Okay. Because even though he's a skeptic, he does not buy into Christian assumptions of St. Anne's. Mm -hmm. He is welcomed at St. Anne's because he recognizes the limitations of nice. So he endorses science, but he recognizes that science, when made absolute, becomes totalitarian. Right. And it seems to me that this is just my theory that came up when I was reading the novel again this time, is that... He represents this synthesis of opposite ways of thinking about things. Huh. That we have to welcome people who are open to both sides of an issue. Oh. And that is the way McPhee is versus, you know, setting up this binary yeah. between heart and head, between Jane and Mark, between nature and science between St. Anne's and Nice. And huh. it's he becomes what, in philosophy, they would call the deconstruction, represents the deconstruction oh. of um, these binaries. Or he's the critical thinker. Uh, Ransom says, oh, he's a very important uh, part here at the St. Anne's community because he's the skeptic. And uh, Lewis always felt that reason and Christianity were not in conflict right. and a good critical thinker. They need each other. It, they need that at the community. Huh. Right. I and think then he's course, based on uh, Kirkpatrick, who Lewis says, the man who oh. taught me to think. I was going to ask you Christian. about who he was based on. Yeah. yeah. Although the fact that he made him um, Scottish, I even thought about George MacDonald. Au contraire. Uh oh. He says in the novel he sounded Scottish, but he was actually an Ulsterman. Which is oh, once again Kirkpatrick. Okay. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. What is for those who don't know, David, and aren't familiar? What is an Ulsterman? What is, an Ulsterman is Northern Ireland in general. That's the old name for it. One time, uh, Tolkien sometimes felt that Lewis was more secretly Protestant than he led on, and he said, "Well, with Lewis, he sounds like he's a mere Christian, but every once in a while." I sense a certain ulterior motive. Ah. Uh, this is one of your more obscure puns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was from Northern Ireland. Uh, he was the one who uh, Lewis studied with for two years before he went off to university. Yeah. And he really loved him, even though he was a skeptic, because he was, but he was very socially awkward. He would be walking through the room when uh, Mrs. Kirkpatrick was having tea with her friends, and he'd hear her remark, and he would turn and say, what is your basis for saying that? What evidence do you have? <laughs> and they go, honey, we're having tea. This is not a debating society. 
So I think some of McPhee's social awkwardness is once again is and his of, sort of desire to debate with everybody and that kind of right, thing. Mm-hmm. right, huh? Okay. Well, and that gets us to even the title of the novel, that hideous strength, which is based on this 16th century poem that is describing the Tower of Babel, mm. and it's as though Lewis is acknowledging that people create these towers of Babel, attempting Mm. to become like God, attempting to transcend human limitations. There's no limit to what we can accomplish. And so the very fact that Lewis brings into St. Anne's another voice, Mm. he's showing we have to to deconstruct those binaries, like the Tower of Babel when God destroyed the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Right. And we, since we mentioned the Tower of Babel, we should mention that the way in which the people at NICE oh, right. uh, lose their efficiency is they all lose the power to communicate. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 So their speech is confused when Merlin shows up. and Yeah. It's a very humorous Babel scene when he destroyed. starts saying, Bundleman, Bundleman, and they all just start <laughs> speaking gibberish. And then they, all the animals they've been experimenting on break yeah. out. So it's a very fitting ending. That hideous strength, actually, in the original, strength means stronghold. So oh. you're thinking about mm. the Tower of Babel as a kind of stronghold of, of humans trying to reach their way into the heavens. Interesting. Well, David, I know you have a theory as to who inspired the character of Jane Steddick. Well, one of the strengths of the novel is the female psychology of Jane Steddick. Normally, people complain about Lewis's female characters not having much dimensionality, but his two best novels for having more fully dimensioned female characters are Jane in That Hideous Strength and uh, a rule in Till We Have Faces. Yeah. And I think that's because both of them, he was drawing on his personal experience with the female. Everybody knows that Joy Davidman certainly was involved in the process of Till We Have Faces, and she typed the manuscript, and they talked about plot devices. But Jane Steddick, Lewis had a student named Mary Shelley, who later became Mary Nalen, and uh, he got to know her as an undergraduate. She struggled and got a fourth-class degree at Oxford, which is not good. And he wrote her a beautiful letter saying, you don't have a fourth class mind. You simply Uh struggled with the Anglo-Saxon portion. And they remained friends uh, for the rest of their lives. In fact, she actually, he became her mentor and also almost like her father figure. But she was unhappily married and she complained about being a slave wife. And he wrote her a letter saying, well, the Anglican rite of marriage gives three reasons for being married. To have children to find a channel for sexual desire and to have companionship. And she was very upset that companionship came third. (laughs) And the very opening of the novel, she's thinking about the Anglican rite of marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I discovered as I looked into the life of uh, Mary Shelley Nalen, that there are at least a dozen similarities with Jane Steddick. Yeah. Uh, They're both unhappily married. They both gave up their faith as children. They're both thinking about psychoanalysis. Several people describe, uh, Jane Steddick is pretty, and Lewis, in a letter, very seldom he did this, but he said, you looked so pretty last time I saw you. Uh, Her daughter later thought that Lewis kind of had a crush on her, and she definitely had a crush on him. She wrote in a letter, I can't decide if it's God that I love or if it's Lewis. Uh, Her daughter found that note in one of her papers. Mm. Do you think that that factors into her kind of attraction to ransom in the novel as well oh i definitely think which so. is kind of weird mm. uh it is and he tries to turn it out toward back toward her husband which yeah. succeeds in doing now lewis said that charles williams did that he tended to have these females who developed an emotional attachment mm. and in some ways it was unhealthy he what this is williams he sometimes had emotional affairs with some yeah. of the younger women that were his devotees and i think lewis is trying to give a better model of how to handle that sort of relationship. Yeah. He actually, in several letters to uh, Mary Nalen said, you know, you're telling me too much personal stuff about your life. You need to find a father confessor or a spiritual director. He actually found one for her, the same oh, one wow. that he used, Father Adams. Try to create some distance. Yeah. I think he realized that there were some emotional boundaries that were being, uh, be getting blurry. Yeah. And so uh, he also made a point to get to know her husband was a lot better human being than uh, than Mark. Than Steddick. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mark. <laughs> so he made a real Poor point Mark. to have a separate relationship and to write him letters. And so I do think part of the reason that she's so uh, 
well-developed uh, psychologically is that he was thinking of someone that he'd known from her undergraduate days before the war all the way until he died. In fact, she huh. visited him uh, on his sickbed very late in life and do a sketch of him oh, wow. before he died. Yeah. For those of you who are listening who want to, you can actually read David's article uh, that he wrote and published in Seven, and it's available for free online. So if you go to journals.wheaton.edu, you can actually find uh, David's article. I think it was published in Volume 36 recently. I believe that's correct. It's one of my favorite titles that we came up with together. I'm asking, is Mary Shelley Nalen the model for Jane Studdick? Uh -huh. And the title of the article, Is Mary Jane? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was a great title, too. I love that. Although we had a very long debate about the question mark, didn't we? Yeah, we did, yeah. yeah. How do you punctuate that? Yeah, that was, that was tough. <laughs> well, as I was rereading it, I like how the novel starts is by showing that Mark has been irresponsible in terms of companionship. And it right. sounds like this goes right. back to the, mm. the model in Mary Nalen, where... Um, he just, once he's married, then, okay, the man's yeah. role is to go out, have his career. And obviously, Lewis is not celebrating Mark as a model we should follow. Yeah. And so this very intelligent woman, she's working on a doctorate yeah. on, um, on John Donne. It reminds me <laughs> of a young woman that we knew decades ago who got married and um, after she came back from her honeymoon and um, was back at work, she just thought this New Yorker cartoon was hilarious because it showed a uh, husband and what or, or a bride and groom getting into the limousine at, at, while people are throwing the rice and <laughs> The bride is saying to the groom, you've changed. <laughs> and it was an obvious New Yorker comment on what Lewis was identifying uh -huh. decades later, where it's just, okay, once the marriage is accomplished, then we have our culturally constructed roles and uh, we go our separate ways. Yeah. Well, that's, and he, he makes that point in the novel. She says, when we were, dating they didn't use that word we had such great conversations we talked about everything now that we're mm. married he just kind of says three words and then goes off to work and then comes home yeah. and says three words well and he has this interesting scene also where mark is coming back from spending the night at nice and doing the sociology at cure hardy and he's mark is trying to think of what he's going to say to her in his head but it's not a lie as much as he's trying to make himself look good and so he's going to give her a false version of the story. And then she thinks in her head, how is she going to give him a sort of false? And so you can see like they're not really giving each other their true selves. They're sort right. of playing these culturally constructed roles, but they're, and that's creating this distance between them, you know, where they're sort of like pretending to be a husband and wife in 1940s England, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And having to rehearse what their conversations will sound like. Exactly. Yeah. That's not a good sign in marriage. You yeah. want a little mm -hmm. bit more spontaneity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most controversial part of the novel is, um, uh, Ransom dispenses quite a bit of advice about marriage and male headship in marriage and obedience and having children. Uh, when we meet Merlin, part of the reason he's very upset with Jane is because she was supposed to have a child who was going to be very important in this spiritual battle. Yeah, that's an odd part in the story. It is, yeah. And that's that what is what bothers people. It's kind of ironic because Mary Nalen uh sought out Lewis's vice not only in marriage but uh, marriage but child raising. Oh, really? And <laughs> one time Mrs. Moore heard this conversation or heard some account of it and says is that fool of a woman coming to you for advice on raising children? <laughs> but apparently she was. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Dorothy Sayers said of um, Lewis, he has a total blank in his mind when it comes to women. And <laughs> she says all his knowledge about relationships comes straight out of Milton. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. She, she called him a frightened bachelor at one point. Right. Dorothy yeah. Sayers. Right. Yeah, we should probably get to why we're uh, talking about that hideous strength in terms of the tapes that we're going to play. Because yeah. another oh, motif right. we haven't talked much about is Merlin. We did mention that he's unhappy right. with Jane because yeah, yeah, he's not yeah. having children. But it's interesting to ask, why did Lewis choose this excerpt when he was asked, this was 1960, Bill Gresham came to visit his son soon after 
uh, soon after Joy Davidman's death, and he brought a tape recorder, and he asked Lewis to read some passages. And of all the things in that hideous strength that he could read, he picks out the chapter where Merlin first comes to St. Anne's and confronts Ransom. Chapter 13, section 1. Exactly. Uh, I would have loved to hear him do the descent of the gods when, uh-huh. as mm. each planetary influence comes to St. Anne's, they become mm. mercurial and then they become uh, Venusian or think yeah. about love and romance. And it's a brilliant piece of writing. Yeah, or even the destruction of Nice would have been interesting. Yeah, that would have been fun. Yes, um, yeah. We had uh, Michael Ward, when we did an interview with him, read this section on the descent of the gods. And he did a beautiful job bringing yeah. out uh, Lewis's wonderful prose. Well, David, let's listen to the second part of the clip, and then afterwards we can discuss uh, why you think Lewis read this passage from chapter 13 in this encounter with Ransom and Merlin. Uh, so let's listen, and then we can talk about it some more. You answered well, said the stranger. I thought there were but three men in the world that knew this question. But my second may be harder. Where is the ring of Arthur the king? What lord has such a treasure in his house? The ring of the king, said Ransom, is on Arthur's finger, when he sits in the house of kings in the cut-shaped land of Habhalion, beyond the seas of Lure in Peralandra. For Arthur did not die, but our lord took him to be in the body to the end of time and the shattering of Salva, with Enoch and Elias and Moses and Melchizedek the king. Melchizedek is he in whose hall the steep stone ring sparkles on the forefinger of the Pendragon. Well answered, said the stranger. In my college it was thought that only two men in the world knew this. But as for my third question, no man knew the answer but myself. Who will be Pendragon in the time when Saturn descends from his sphere? In what world did he learn war? In the sphere of Venus I learned war, said Ransom. In this age, Lorga shall descend. I am the Pendragon. When he had said this, he took a step backwards, for the big man had begun to move, and there was a new look in his eyes. Any who had seen them as they stood thus face to face would have thought that it might come to fighting at any moment. But the stranger hadn't moved with hostile purpose. Slowly, ponderously, Yet not awkwardly, as though a mountain sank like a wave, he sank on one knee, and still his face was almost on a level with the director's. So, David, what is your theory as to why this section was chosen by Lewis to read aloud? I think he opened the book at random like people do with the Bible and said, oh, okay. Well, he loved King Arthur, and Mm. his friends had written about King Arthur, uh, Charles Williams had written two books of poems about uh, Arthurian themes. And Charles Williams is the one who came up with the idea of Logris as sort of the spiritual ideal of England. He had the idea that every country, uh, Britain represents the materialistic, utilitarian, uh, earthy side of Britain, and Logris represents its spiritual mm. aspirations. And Logris is a word f- that means Wales, uh, or it's the Welsh word for England, excuse me. Oh. But... Uh, Charles Williams is the one who decided that Logris represented the spiritual side of England. And so I think he wanted to get in that idea of Logris versus Britain. They also needed Merlin because both sides want to get a hold of Merlin because they want to channel actual spiritual powers for their own purposes. Mm, Yeah. We find out late in the novel that Nice is actually uh, these bent Eldils that he calls them macrobes rather than microbes. They're they're larger than human life. (laughs) And so the people at Nice want to get a hold of Merlin to channel evil powers. Uh, Lewis made the point in several books that science and magic actually were twins in the uh, Renaissance. They're both technologies for power. And magic died out because it didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Whereas science Uh kept growing because it actually achieved results. But at Nice, they're both trying to be scientific and liquidate the unfit, Uh but they're also trying to channel uh, old school magic and bring Merlin Mm. back. Yeah, which is interesting because the Nazis were fascinated with the occult, by the way. They were. Mm. I think that's another resemblance. Get rid of the theology about God being incarnate in Christ and just get to the magic tricks. Yeah. But I think another reason you may have chosen this passage, when you study narrative structure, 
they often talk about how to create drama in a scene. And obviously conflict creates drama, but there's a narrative device called the seesaw where there's a shift of power in the scene. And so the person who is on top thinks he's the powerful individual versus the person on the bottom. But as the scene develops, the shift of power gradually turns until one person is brought low and the other goes up on high. Oh. And I think he may have chosen this because of his dramatic power. Because when Merlin first shows up at St. Anne's, he doesn't respect Ransom at all. Yeah, well, so we've already listened to that first clip uh, in the opening of the podcast. You guys have already heard the first two minutes of him reading from chapter 13. And so, you know, he shows up and he's wet and all this. And so, yeah, so we've already heard that first part. But, yeah, there's a lot of drama at the beginning. Sorry to interrupt right. you, David. So you're... Uh, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because Ransom is wearing ordinary clothes. He's seated because he has a wound in his heel, yeah. which is very Christ-like that he uh, obtained when he was battling on Paralandra. And Merlin sees this uh, you know, wounded man just sitting in ordinary clothes and thinks he might be a stable boy. Yeah. He also mm. knocks McP McPhee senseless. You know, he just with a <laughs> wave of the hand, McPhee is gone. He's unconscious. Yeah. And he starts asking questions. Well, who are you? I need to meet your leader. And then Ransom says, well, actually, I'm the person you need to be talking to. I'm the one in authority. And he just, as you know from the clip, he doesn't believe it. Merlin doesn't. Yeah. And so he puts him through uh, a series of questions that no one would know except for somebody who's very inside in Logris, somebody who really knows about the spiritual side of Britain. Uh, Merlin has been awakened from 15 centuries of sleep. The old tradition from Arthurian legend is that he was uh, convinced by Nimue and that she actually put him into this long sleep. Some people say he slept inside of a tree, which oh, is wow. interesting because Lewis has him sounding like a real tree when Merlin comes in. He's yeah. Like a living tree. yeah. But as he asks the questions, uh, he says, well, what is Solva? And Ransom says, well, that's the moon. And he talks about the people on the moon who uh, don't uh, procreate properly. But Merlin is very impressed that he knows the answer to that. that yeah. What is Solva? It's the moon. He says, well, where's the ring of Arthur? And Ransom says, well, actually, it's on Paralandra that Arthur didn't die. He was translated, and he's resting and healing from his wounds in Avalon, which is the old tradition that Arthur never died. The third question, who is the Pendragon? That's the biggest secret. The Pendragon is the leader of Logris. It was originally Arthur's father, and then it was Arthur himself. And Lewis surmises there's been a secret issue tradition all ever since Camelot of some spiritual leader who's in the spiritual underground who one day is going to come forth and do battle with the forces of evil, which is what's going to happen later in the novel. Yeah. And so when he says, who is the Pendragon? Ransom says, well, I'm the Pendragon. Mm -hmm. And Merlin suddenly feels deflated and he feels like this is not some modern that I don't have to take seriously. This is someone that I have to do obeisance to. And so it's a beautiful scene in terms of dramatic reversal of power. Mm. And later on, Merlin, of course, joins that side and becomes an ally of St. Anne's in their fight with uh, Nice. Right. Mm. Your discussion of uh, the battling spiritual forces and Logris as representing the spiritual side of Britain suddenly makes me wonder about another character name at Nice, and that's Hingus. Right. He's the person yeah. who warns Mark and he ends up getting killed because he's kind of betrayed right. nice. But I immediately think of Hengus and Horsa, right. who are the famous Anglo-Saxons who came to Britain and battled Arthur, right? Right. And huh. that's... Part of the surprise, when Merlin is interrogating Ransom about, you know, where's the emperor and where are all these powers who should be fighting against this evil shadow that's overcoming England? Ransom kind of says, well, I hate to tell you this, but actually we're all descended from the Saxons. There's very few Celts. And Merlin is upset because in his time it was the Celts <laughs> fighting the Saxons. Oh, right. So it's kind of a shock for Merlin to realize that eventually they lost that war. Yeah. The but to make the name Hengus be the person, once again, who, like McPhee, who sees both side, sides of the issue. So uh, Hengus recognizes the problem huh. of this institution he is identified with. And a lot of people don't realize that Ch Thomas Jefferson, when he was designing or helping to design the seal of the United States wanted to put Hengist and Horsa on the seal of the United States what? because he thought that Anglo-Saxons came up with 
the ideal legal system really? before the Norman conquest because it was the Normans who brought in a feudal hierarchical system to huh. England. Wow, I did not know that. Uh, Hingis is also the guy I referred to as Bill the Blizzard who gets killed in the oh. Gods of Light. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's several people at NICE who are trying to resist this movement. There's Bill the Blizzard. I always thought that was a misprint. He talks about his big nose. I thought he should have been called Bill the Buzzard. <laughs> um, but Glossop and Canon Jewel. Uh-huh. Uh, and Lewis liked that name. Jewel the Unicorn shows up in Last Battle. Yeah. Uh, but there's several people that are trying to fight against this totalitarian movement at NICE and at Bracton College, but they're all eliminated or neutralized in one so way or the other. why come up with another name for Hengist? Why Bill the Blizzard? They're, they named the same person? That was what they, the that was his nickname, people yeah. at oh, Braxton nickname. College called okay. him that behind his I back. I forgot that. Sorry. Right. It's easier for me to say Bill the Blizzard than Hingus. So that's why I said <laughs> Bill the Blizzard. Yeah, we'll see. I just focus on Hingus because I think the whole history. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, people don't realize that England is called England because of the Anglo Saxons coming in, right? right? Angle. And they're yeah. called that because they come from that angle in Europe where Denmark sticks up above. Germany yeah. just creates an angle so that it's the Angle Saxons. Really? Yeah. Hence Angleland. Right. Huh. I did and not did know, you know that. that Roosevelt wanted to make the seal of the United States uh, Gilbert and Sullivan. David. <laughs> <laughs> so as we wrap up, I have a I have a question for you guys. What is what is the takeaway? What do you think the takeaway or the application of that hideous strength is? for us today. I know we've touched on a lot of different things. Um, I was fascinated by listening uh, and reading through it. I was listening on Audible and then reading it in the evenings um, of the way that Lewis talks about sort of the sterilization of nature and mm. the way that they, like they're going to divert the river and then dam it up and it'll flood this town, but they'll build a new planned community and they're going to tear down the church and this sort of focus on efficiency and the way that that just sort of ruthlessly destroys nature in order to achieve some sort of human ideal um, and the contrast between the gardens at Belbury and then the garden at uh, St. Anne's with the mm -hmm. planks and the sort of winding path and everything. And so that really stood out to me recently just because of the focus on with the pandemic and the lockdown and the mm. sort of retreat from nature I read the story the other day about the songbirds in San Francisco started singing a different song during the wow. lockdown because they were having to scream so loud over the noise in this urban environment that they gave up on singing these more beautiful, rich songs and they just were kind of squawking to make noise above the, the din of San Francisco. And when it quieted down during the lockdown, they started singing the more beautiful songs of their more wild counterparts. Wow, and, that is so cool. And it just broke my heart. As I thought, this is what we're doing to these, yeah. just to these little songbirds. Think about what else we're doing to all these other animals. And so that was one of the things that stood out to me that I felt was very relevant in this. In the other novels, you know, they're on other planets and it's easy to mm -hmm. extrapolate those things. But this, Lewis really kind of depicts it in really interesting terms. The destruction, the construction that happens and the way that they like dig everything up and they're cutting down trees right. and he mm. describes it as a nightmare um, just really resonated with me. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, that was one of the things that I kind of took away from it this last read through. And it brings us back to a um, leitmotif that has been part of many of our podcasts, the importance of romanticism. Yeah. So you get the emphasis on British romanticism where nature is being destroyed by technology. Yeah. Um, but you also get the German romanticism where the supernatural and yeah. the the strange it infuses culture. Yeah, Merlin is in this wood and it's, you know, hidden away. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think both Lewis and Tolkien had this sense that nature takes its revenge eventually. Yeah. I don't know whether or not our listeners believe in uh, climate change, but all the fires we're having out west and in Australia and they're even having fires in Africa, there's a sense that human activity and technology is actually changing nature. And at some point nature is going to strike back. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, people talked a lot about this uh, staff that was resistant to antibiotics and people have been taking uh. antibiotics for so many smaller sore throats and things, or even when they didn't need them Yeah. that when they really need 
antibiotics, their body's built up this resistance or the mm-hmm. staff has built up a resistance. Yeah. And so whether it's the ints marching off to destroy uh, cerumen at, at Orthanc or whether it's all the animals being released at the end of the story, they've been yeah. all used for experiments. Yeah. And they become the instrument by which a lot of the people at NICE are destroyed. Yeah. You also have the earth opening up and swallowing them up, almost like this Old Testament vision of the yeah. evil right. people being well, swallowed up you know, by the know, they earth. Previously, they were digging up and ripping up the earth. Right. And then the earth yeah. opens up and swallows them. Yeah. yeah I, poetic I have, justice. I have an article that is going to be published this fall on the microbiome and the ways that science in the early 20th century, the goal was the sterilization of microbes. And now all of a sudden we're realizing that the microbes that live within us are actually a crucial part of our Mm. flourishing human lives. And Mm. now all of a sudden we're trying to reclaim that. And it turns out antibiotics have these sort of secondary effects on our bodies. And, Mm. you know, and so, yeah, there's that side of uh, nature and life that we're sort of realizing that we've done more damage to. And it's, kept us from living out flourishing lives and imaging God on the world. Another uh, contrast we forgot to mention was that nice, all the animals are in cages and being used yeah. for experiments. Whereas at St. Anne's you have Mr. Bultitude, <laughs> which was an actual bear at the Whipsnade Zoo that the Lewis brothers like to go visit. Oh, really? And, uh, but he's the, obviously a family pet uh, rather yeah. than, than being used for experimentation. Yeah. Uh, My other takeaway goes back to what Crystal said about abstraction. If you see people abstractly as this social class or this particular identity group, you're likely to not have the kind of empathy that you need for them as individuals. And as Christians, it's imperative to always start with empathy, always start with that person as someone that God loves rather than to put them in a certain class that you consider to be in opposition to. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. My other takeaway is, don't take human heads and try to keep them alive <laughs> oh. artificially. <laughs> we just think that's... Yeah, please don't do that. I love how when Jane meets the head at St. Anne's, it's Ransom. Yeah. And she just feels this glorious feeling of renewal. There's almost this mystical experience of, uh-huh. of feeling that she's encountering someone who's in direct contact with, with God. Whereas when Mark, her husband, meets the head... At nice, he's Ugh. horrified by this gruesome experiment. Yeah. It's one of, you know, one of those clever contrasts. It's, it's kind of crazy that there is a thing, you can actually have your head frozen in order to try and live, you know, be unfrozen in the future when science is able oh, yeah, to read. I mean, that's yeah. a thing. Like, you right. people can actually do that. And it's, you, it's one of those things where Lewis writes that in the novel, and I don't think it was a thing when he wrote about it, but now people are like, I'm going to have my head frozen. So yeah, I they have home kits. You can forever. keep them in your freezer there, <laughs> you know, right next to the ice cream and the... Well, I just want to thank everybody for, if you haven't listened to the Wade Center podcast and you found your way here because of the Lost Lewis tapes, if you want to hear Lewis read all of chapter 13 from that hideous strength and then also Paralandra, which we just did an episode on recently, you can go to the Rabbit Room and there'll be a link in the show notes and you can actually purchase those recordings by Lewis and you can listen to him read from Paralandra for 27 minutes and from that hideous strength. And then he also reads from Chaucer in Middle English, which is actually kind of fun and neat to hear him pronounce all those words. And so 45 minutes of never-before-heard Lewis recordings that you can go get over at the Rabbit Room for, I think, like $3. And so we're excited to make these available to you guys and play excerpts during the podcast. But we want to give you the whole experience. And so maybe you could get a copy of Paralandra or That Hideous Strength and open it up and let Lewis read it to you. And we hope you guys can enjoy the Lost Lewis tapes. And we're grateful that you guys tuned in. And if you like the podcast, we hope that you would listen to some of the other episodes that we've talked about. David, you mentioned The Descent of the Gods. Didn't we have Michael Ward read that for we us? We did. He did a beautiful job. Yeah. So uh, if you want to hear that, you can actually go listen to the, our episode with Michael Ward. Thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Crystal. Let's go do some dishes. <laughs> The Wade Center podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu. 
or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.